T-minus three, two, one, zero. Hey, my friends, welcome to the Launch Sequence Podcast, episode 150. Yay. There's no significance to that. It's just another number, but, you know, it's a nice round number. I like it. It's cool. Today, we're going to talk about a pretty exciting topic. One of the biggest features in Star Citizen, something they've been working on for a while, and it's going to change the game in quite a big way, but it's only coming to Arena Commander in 323. We don't quite know what's going to come when it's going to come to the rest of the game, but it's highly anticipated, and my friend Loud Guns here, he's he's done some talking on it. Uh, I know you love to focus on some ships and the gameplay inside of them, so I wanted to bring you on. And we could talk about like the details of this gameplay, but also how it's going to affect solo players, because I think they're really concerned when it comes to what's going to happen when you know my ship's getting broken down or experiencing glitches. So thank you for joining me for the talk today. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, thanks. And congratulations on 150 episodes so i didn't realize i was on a special anniversary show yay you might say it's just a number i'm gonna say it's incredibly special so oh, i mean uh, it's special because you're here <laughs> screw the number <laughs> but yeah engineering gameplay looks really interesting and yeah. i think i think there are a lot of things in star citizen where where there's a concern that it might be the end for solo solo play um which i Completely think ending. agree is probably overhyped <laughs> no solo <laughs> gameplay anymore yeah, yeah, just no. Have to find a massive friends list. Yeah, but no. Yeah, no. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to getting into the details on that. But before we get really into things, I kind of just want to know how have you been feeling about Star Citizen lately? Yeah, I think I've been feeling pretty good about it recently. Been, but I think particularly a lot of it is the excitement for three twenty three. Um, so three twenty two has been a been a good patch been having a good time um particularly more in the aspect of treating it as a sandbox and finding fun things to do with with the org with the community um but 323 looks like it's a uh, looks like it's sort of the delivery point for a lot of that exciting stuff we saw last year at CitizenCon. so um so i i mean, there's so so much to be hyped for but I don't know, as somebody who spends a lot of time setting up things for big events, I'm just really looking forward to a personal hangar. Yes. So I don't have to go down to a Platinum Bay on Ariel and load up a bunch of STVs into a CT. That's... Yeah. Being able, not only being able to um, like store things at the hangar and just have your, your, your folks come in and get whatever supplies they need, armor, weapons, whatever, but also being able to get vehicles at the hangars. Oh, man, yeah. that's yeah. going to be nice. That will be absolutely huge. So, and I think it's a really good step forward. It makes it feel more like a, more like an MMO. Yeah. Frankly, it's sort of a first step. Of, even if it's quite a baby step, it's a first step on the road to things like player housing. Oh which yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always been just such a, such a critical part of MMOs and a lot of RPG type games for me. So. Yeah. Now they start combining this. Uh the the persistence of these hangars with the interior buildings that they're the building interiors they're working on in montreal and yeah we get we get apartments in the game we start having residences yeah. in different planets that's that's when cosmetics can really start taking off too <laughs> um yeah the the hangers are cool 323 is feeling really good um i think i think many people might be surprised at how many of the features were initially stated to be in 323 that are now looking like they're going to make the cut it's a lot of times people are used to you know features falling off throughout the months before but they, I think they've added more than they've taken off this time. Yeah, yeah, it certainly certainly seems to be surprising on the upside, which is not par for the course. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, one one thing that I did drop into um, the Vacati build, which you're now allowed to talk about, which is yeah, which is amazing, and it just made me realize I've I've done a little bit of master modes in sort of Arena Commander, but now having to, it might be a little case of learning to fly again. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I almost splattered on the first space station I uh, I came to. So, uh, <laughs> do so you like it? Uh, I I think so. I think so. Uh, and I didn't actually splat, so I didn't crash. Okay. That's so, uh, so that's a good start. Good feedback. Uh, but I think it'll be really interesting to see see master modes in the con. I know a lot of the context of the discussion has been around combat. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how 
how a different flight model affects a whole lot of other aspects of the game. Right. You know, I spent more of my time on average doing like industrial gameplay. So, um, and there really haven't been any videos about sort of uh, master modes in the context of a industry player or a cargo player. So, right. so it'd be interesting to see. It's, it, yeah. And it, I think, I think it's, a lot of it is because we just haven't been able to experience it ourselves in those ships. You know, it's one thing to speculate about how it'll go, but how does an industrial ambush go when you're in a caterpillar and they're in two arrows it's hard to like just talk about that and i am interested in seeing how it affects the rest of the game too the side of master modes i'm more excited about though doesn't get any talk the, the quantum boost stuff the actual navigation stuff i'm like where's the give me the the fun movement in game yeah absolutely so 323 is feeling good for you how are you feeling this time last year it's hard to almost cast my mind back. I think as as we were chatting <laughs> before the show, this Way is um, back in the day. This is this is the busiest time my my real life gets in real life work. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is quite often the time I find myself playing the least Star Citizen, or in fact any games, um, as my as my real job heats up. So uh, contrary real to popular, job. contrary to popular belief, I do have to have two jobs to to make this work so so yeah it's um, I feel like that well well okay let's say then how are you feeling mid-year last year yeah um i i think there's always there's always typically a bit of a mid-year lull isn't there i think it I think it comes coincides with you know standard holiday season but there's always a a bit of a time sort of in the middle of the year where you know we got the citizen con um details earlier this this week of like mm -hmm. sort of they they announced when the tickets are going on sale um but there's always a little bit of like a cooling off period um and i i do sort of wonder whether we're going to get this amazing 323 patch with lots and lots of features and um maybe some more coming in 323.x type patches but then whether we might not see a bit of a bit of a quieter year after that in the build up to citizen mm. con because they do always hold back and save some stuff if you know what i mean can it be quiet though look at look at how hardcore they've gone on like slowly trickling out the hype for 323. yeah do you think I, they could do that again for 4.0 or or do you think they're going to try and keep it closer to the chest just because of the nature of the patch i, th I think maybe for a 4.0 patch you might see it see things a bit closer to the chest it's you know there's the you saw all the hype around sort of the pyro playground stuff but that said i mean we'll probably see more of that sort of um little bits of pyro coming out uh, so so I, I always forget the name of the extra test universe that we have which um uh, the uh which put pyro into tech technical preview preview channel technical preview channel that's yeah. it so I, I think with that we might we might get a bit of a preview of these things um so if they want to test them properly it's hard not to signpost what could be big announcements so um so yeah and and to be fair maybe there's just a bit of a different scope in terms of speed of development now because clearly a lot of developers have moved back over from from squadron mm -hmm. and if 323 is and it's it's hard to work out is 323 just a a random bump with a lot of content or is it representative of a um of a bit of a change in terms yeah. of the, the speed of development so i guess we'll see with 324 if we get a 324 or uh, or indeed 4.0 so it's definitely an ongoing question in the community is this a is this all of that work that they've been doing in squadron just kind of all coming at once and catching us up and it'll go back to normal after 323 or is this indicative of the pace going forward i think it's the latter to be honest i think um certainly hope so. I yeah i don't think because like look at all the starting points of all these systems they're not really things that just started last year or, the, or even the year before like we saw engineering in 2021 they were talking about the star map in 2019 um the uh uh gosh what everything else that's uh distribution centers were like 2022 mm -hmm. um citizen con ugfs like there's just a lot of stuff here that's multi-year initiatives and it doesn't feel like they just started it a couple quarters ago so you know 
It's also taking into account that there are features they haven't been talking about that we know they've been working on, like bounty hunting, asteroid locations, hacking. So I think in terms of like the polish that we're seeing with the FPS systems, it does feel like it could be a big push of this patch. But in terms of the significance of the features we're getting, I think this is going to be the way it is now. Absolutely. And I think there's also the element of certain tech hurdles maybe blocked bigger development on other aspects of this. Yeah. There's no point necessarily putting certain stuff in and getting a, a finalized version of it if you don't have your flight model finalized or if you don't have your uh, you don't have things like server meshing actively being tested and understand how those things are going to work so um so yeah i mean, fingers crossed fingers yep. crossed this is fingers and toes everything's crossed <laughs> yeah uh, um it's an exciting time no doubt uh confusing but exciting who knows what's going to be happening by the end of the year i do think though we can assume multi-crew gameplay is going to be quite a bit different how about we how about we talk about that Absolutely. So let's start by talking about the difference between solo gameplay and multi-crew gameplay. Because, um, well, you can kind of just solo any ship, right? It's, there's, <clears throat> there is no difference between the ship types in the game right now. Would you say that? Yeah, it's like how big your cargo hold, basically. Yeah. So if you look, looking at traders sort of in particular... It's literally just, you know, you might start in something small like a freelancer, but everybody gravitates towards a C2 because there's there's nothing stopping them. Right. Yeah. So nobody you... gravitates to a whole C because you can't use it properly. But <laughs> if you could, uh, then they would. <laughs> like, man, we, we tried to get out a whole C the other day and I couldn't even get into the docking port. I was just stuck <laughs> in the space station. Yeah. Um, so can you, do you feel like you could define what is currently multi-crew gameplay in Star Citizen? There's, um, there are, there are a number of ships which are fun to multi-crew, but it's, the game isn't pushing you in that direction. Like it's very definitely not meta. So, so thing, things like crewing a fully crewed hammerhead is a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, if you get, particularly if you get sort of five, four or five turret gunners alongside the pilot, you know, it feels a bit bad sticking somebody into that rear tail gun seat where they don't get to do very much. <laughs> but um, but yeah, if you get a good few of you onto a ship like a Hammerhead or a Redeemer or, or a Carrick, you know, there's a lot of fun that you can have rocking around the verse with your friends. Um, but it's not necessarily, it's not meta. It's, you know, uh, nine times out of ten, you would be better off in, you know, either all in your own ship um, or maybe in some smaller like heavy fighters with with one turret on them you know just the maths of the dps you know you would you would be outputting more dps and you would be um not a juicy big target yeah you know, if if your one hammerhead gets taken out then that is that is all six or seven of you down whereas if you come in four vanguards with turrets then then one of them gets blown up then that's only only two out of eight of you mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's sort of the maths of multi crew doesn't really stack up at the moment, um, and I think there was there was a comment that John Crew made a little while ago when he was talking about uh, multi crew gameplay in the future, particularly with relation to capital ships. That was, um, and he sort of said we don't want to put capital ships into the game if it's just going to feel like a bigger canoe. Right. And I just yeah. always always really liked that term for it because. Because, yeah, at the end of the day, sort of a hammerhead right now, yeah, it's got more turrets on it, but it's it's not really any different, so to speak, than than a Vanguard. It's a ship with a pilot and some turrets that you can fit inside. And there's nothing really different system-wise going on in the bigger ships than in the small ships. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's about to change. Yeah. That's what we're what we're discussing today so you're so. kind of you're kind of getting at the resource network which is what they were calling this all before they came up with engineering gameplay and the resource network i think the coolest part about it is it's something they want to put in like the the cities and outposts and space stations too but in ships um at least what it sounds like you're you're getting at is that 
this network of resources is used to make each ship actually function differently rather than just being a, a, a different set of numbers or um yeah. or or uh statistics let's let's see let's talk about what each of those resources is um or not what, what each one is, but rather what's important, do you think, to a ship like a Hammerhead? And how does that change when you do have to start considering resources? So you've got gravity, coolant, um, you got to worry about heat, actual power, uh, life support, like, and, and fuel. How do you think adding all of those things to the Hammerhead does change it from just being that, that set of turrets? At least, you know, and this is heavy um speculation kind of what you imagine but we've watched enough of their okay. presentations on this to kind of theorize well i think i think possibly one of one of the things which will really start to separate out the bigger ships versus the smaller ones is that they'll be that bit harder to kill so they they won't because time to kill is on average going intended to go up yeah we've already had it to some degree with soft death as opposed to going straight to you know, everything just goes boom yeah um, and it, but I'd imagine that will it, you know, you'll get that that element of things will go wrong before they go catastrophically wrong yeah they kind of talk about you not even blowing up really in the future right mm -hmm. you just kind of disintegrate you just break apart yeah. by components and parts yeah and I think it you might you might get those scenarios mind you where you know a critical part it's the it's the old Star Trek trope of what <laughs> yeah. is it the uh, the reactor going uh, going critical which yeah, it seems reactor. to every every two episodes. Yeah, so, uh, they should protect that thing better. Probably safety people at, at the Star Trek Federation really need a <laughs> need a talking to. Um, but I think on the bigger ships, you probably have less chance of that critical failure. Um, and on the other hand, yeah, you know, if you sort of think about it, I guess in in more realistic terms, and I'm always I'm always very cautious about getting into the too much into the realism because I, I always like to kick myself and remind myself Star Citizen's a game and games should be designed to be fun and that's not necessarily to make everything realistic um, but looking at real ships you know if a part of a ship floods then a bigger ship has the opportunity to you know close bulkheads contain that damage you know be that a fire be that flooding so um, so yeah I think on the bigger ships you'll probably have more more ability to contain something which might lead to a critical failure um and you'll probably also you know i wouldn't underestimate the fact that something like a hammerhead has a cargo room whereas something like a vanguard doesn't so so with regard to that you know you can bring spare parts you can bring yeah. maybe spare spare resources if if things like you know does coolant come in a box if we run out of coolant can we can we plug some more in for want of a better term yeah uh, whereas Kinda, if, if we're in a fighter we can't do that it really starts to emphasize the longer distance gameplay in this game which i guess we haven't really experienced because there's just you can go anywhere in stanton and you're near civilization absolutely yeah being able to actually store components in your ship w would be really com important um there are some ships that do have multi-crew roles, right? Like, there are a couple applications where we actually can do multiple people on a ship and it makes sense, like mining and stuff. Um, are there any others you can think of, though? I'm just thinking of, like, the mole. But are there any others in the game right now that actually call for more than one person to be on the ship for it to be most effective? Besides, like, a turret gunner? Yeah, current, currently it's, it's mostly sort of in terms of actually using them. It would be things like the the mining ships like the mole and the salvage ships like the reclaimer mm -hmm. you know you you can feasibly solo a reclaimer but it's um it's so slow and so dull that i wouldn't recommend anyone does um i would i would argue sort of particularly when it comes to turrets to a degree trading ships would be one of those which i would say this is this is kind of very rewarding for multi-crew gameplay um because uh, particularly as turrets get stronger, sort of the deterrence factor, if a group of pirates do happen to come across you at a trading outpost and you've just loaded up, and then they start firing at you, but you start firing back with two turrets, 
Um, it's just a. I, I think more people should be trading like that, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, sort of particularly when we get into physically having to move cargo, that will become even more and more common. Um, so you know, you won't be going and doing your six hundred and ninety-six SU runs in your in your C two without at least a buddy to help um, with the tractor beaming. Would be uh, would be my theory there. Yeah, that's really going to start breaking up the gameplay too. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how how many people are actually interested in being that buddy that just kind of sits on board and goes to lift those boxes. But then you can kind of work two jobs, right? You could be the turret gunner, the engineer when things go wrong, and the person who's unloading boxes if, mm -hmm. if, if that's just what you decide to do. That's kind of the nice part about this is there's, no, there's not like a skill tree you have to follow to be able to be an engineer. You can just... yeah pick up a tractor beam and start moving components if you want. Yeah, and that's, that's quite a huge sort of difference in SC, really, with the the lack of sort of these skills, sort of artificial gates on what you can and can't do. It's really down to the the skill you've built up, whether you've learned those gameplay loops. Um, and I think that's sort of where, where it's very important to make sure that these gameplay loops actually have differences to them and different um different gameplay mechanics that you need to learn and be good at so that so that there's a difference between somebody who's an expert at something um and somebody who is a bit of a jack of all trades um both of which are good good options for sure you haven't scared tomato off <laughs> no you guys know how it is call to prayer over here gotta get to close the window real quick um yeah it's it's uh it really does mix up how this game works when, you know, we have so many conversations about things. Honestly, Master Modes, I think is a really good example. We were talking about Master Modes before this show started. Um, we've talked about it on this show quite a few times, but it's, it's, it's a small piece in a really big puzzle that has things like engineering, physical armor, the Maelstrom system, uh, you know, repair gameplay, NPCs that can be hired as crew, a lot of stuff that can kind of shift the dynamic of what's important in the game. And I think this this whole thing, engineering, introducing this multi-crew is a really big part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you... I, think, I think it's worth touching because we, we didn't mention, so when we were talking about differences with big ships versus um, small ships going forward, physical armor is one which we would would get picked up on if we yeah. didn't mention. Um, and I think yeah. that, that does really change the dynamics of sort of a hammerhead versus a fighter or uh, or particularly as you go bigger so that's that's the other thing which is still to really get worked out that will uh, will change those dynamics of rock paper scissors in terms of ship combat yeah it's kind of an interesting balance because i think and we're about to talk about this uh i think engineering is seen very much as a uh, a debuff to big ships you know oh you can't be as effective in big ships big ships won't work as well with less people people see it as a way to control those big ships but then you get armor which basically is emphasizing the fact that small ships can't damage those big ships and mm -hmm. those the way those two balance out will be interesting to watch as well because like there's there's a whole bunch of talk when it comes to pay to get advantage when it comes into big ships having more advantages like that and the, and you know not to say that is some kind of an advantage that people are paying for but that's just another podcast <laughs> but um it's there's a lot to consider when talking about uh this engineering stuff yeah so let's go back to um the actual things in the engineering or rather engineering as a whole because we've been dancing around what it is um but can you do you think we can do a pretty good job of just running, like summarizing everything we've seen so far from the three different types of engineering to, to what actually people are supposed to do when they're taking part in this stuff? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I hope so. hope my memory of CitizenCon is yeah. uh, not, as, not as faulty as it could be. <laughs> let's, let's start off with, um, I guess let's go through like the chronological order of how an engineer might, might work. So the, the, the first part of engineering would be the tuning. And they haven't actually told us much about that, but do you have any kind of ideas of what that could mean? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of room for a really interesting gameplay loop here, um, and it's more like sort of historically 
you know, when you were able to just overclock parts um, and you just sort of sit in your uh, sit in your ship and just you know just go well I'm just going to turn that up but that might be going back to sort of 313. Um, I think the role of sort of a tuner is somebody who sits basically back at your base or you know it might be on a carrier something like a Kraken mm -hmm. uh, working on ships which before they even go out so you know fighter pilots have got their um got their gladiuses or arrows sort of at the ready in the hangar and your tuner is going round and they're, they're the person trying to get the most out of out of the parts um and we might have to sort of be contending with things like wear and tear in parts in the future so it might be there that they're trying to calibrate parts which are maybe not at 100 percent uh to try and try and get the most performance out of them with the potential to maybe over tune parts so that they can deliver you know the, the very simple um example of a shield a shield part you know it might have a thousand hit points of um of hp maybe with good tuning that that engineer can get it to 1100 the same part in optimum That's, conditions that would be cool it's it's then though how do you, how do you make that gameplay enjoyable gameplay to do yeah um, and that's that's really over to game designers but how, um, how do you make overclocking fun yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah that is i like that idea that you can kind of permanently overclock a part at least for you know maybe like two hours or an hour or something like that and you can only do it with certain equipment that's maybe just in hangers or something like that i also love the idea of the larger components are the more complex the startup sequence is. So, so mm -hmm. if you, as a tuner, you get out to the hangar before your crew, maybe you all are running like a hammerhead, you get out there before your crew and you run the startup sequence, which takes two minutes, right? It doesn't have to be something crazy. It takes a minute, two minutes, I don't know. Um, and because you ran through it, through it like that, you get a little bit of a buff. Maybe yeah. your ship, just like your, your power supply is running a little bit more efficient or something like that um as opposed to just kind of going out and starting the ship up it's that that sort of yeah. like here we'll reward you for the planning and we'll give you it's somebody's job to be able to do this but again then you run into that whole idea of how do you make that fun yeah exactly um but i think that and i think it's one of the things which does come up with engineering gameplay a lot different things are different things are fun to different people that's one of the great things about sc more generally yeah and and there will be some people who you know, there'll probably be some crews where it'll be like um i'm not sure if this example is going to translate but when you're playing five-a-side football here in the uk you know, on some teams you just take it in turn to go and go and it's basically like when somebody lets one in then then that's the end of your turn um, and usually those are teams that don't do very well because you're almost incentivized to let a goal to let in, in yeah. so, you can, uh, <laughs> so you can get out and run around a bit. Yeah. Um, but then there are other teams where, you know, somebody turns up and he or she's got their uh, got their own goal goalie gloves and they're, they're ready to be in all game. Um, so I think some crews like that will have dedicated engineers for whom this is exactly the type of gameplay. Yeah that they're craving whereas other crews yeah it might not be our favorite part but we'll we'll take it in turns to be the engineer yeah that and that's like the double-edged sword of this game is the I, this might be too idealistic but the idea that you build a game with so many different styles of gameplay and you want to build them deep enough for people to get a ton of gameplay out of them they have to be not fun to some people because <laughs> we have to depend on some people to do the things we don't want to do or else they'll never get that gameplay. Like imagine if, imagine if flying ships was just so much better than everything else that nobody wanted to do anything but fly the ship and then everybody's just fighting over the pilot seat. That would, it's not, that's not the game we signed up for. Yeah, exactly. But I think, I think how they're approaching, I know it's a different, different area, but how they're approaching the cargo is, is maybe sort of speaks to how they'll look to do the, the same sort of approach they'll take to engineering so the concept of like you can hand load cargo and and do it all do it all yourself or you can pay eff effectively a penalty of time and money um to have the ai do it for you um and that also sort of speaks to the fact that the ai won't do it as well as you could yeah 
you know, because in order for that to be effective, they're going to have to price it and time it so that a good group of cargo loaders on the human side could load that ship quicker um, and and more efficiently. So, so yeah, I think maybe it'll be the same for the engineering. So if yeah. you really want to avoid this, you can pay a pay a fee, um, and and give up time. You know, maybe yeah. your ship will be unavailable for that time. But on the other hand, that tuning would, you know, to take the tuning as an example, you know, you could maybe pay for a pre-flight tune, but it would never be quite as good. You'd never quite achieve the levels that a, a player engaging in this this gameplay loop who was very good at it could achieve. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like an option on the menu. You can just choose and it, it gives you like 50% of what you could have gotten. There's also the, the, the aspect of different items in the game. We're always talking about there's, you know, what are we going to loot? What's that unique thing I'm going to find? Maybe components with additional, not additional. I, I don't want to get into the whole plus 2% power kind of thing, but we have a bunch of components that compare against each other. Who's to say there's not a component that maybe is is less glitch prone, right? That mm -hmm. you might not want to put in the work of engineering. So instead you pay extra for a power plant that can't put out as much power, but also doesn't run into as many glitches and stuff. That's how that's how we do it in the real world. You yeah. so you gotta sometimes you choose the Toyota, sometimes you choose the BMW. Which one's <laughs> gonna last longer? Yeah, um, so like dur durability is a stat in a lot of games. It's yeah. it's it's sort of an important one. Like I, I played a lot of uh, survival games. That's that's more of my background. And when you find certain tools, they might be deemed higher grades, but based on a variety of stats. So you know attack damage or, um, but durability is a key stat. And quite often, sort of particularly if you find harvesting tools, high durability is one of the best stats to. Um, to achieve so yeah it's also more stuff to craft exactly <laughs> there's a lot more stuff to craft guys <laughs> come on all right so that's the tuner and like i said we don't know much info about that so that was just a lot of us talking about what it could be but we know a ton about the mechanic it's like the most active role it feels like that they've introduced so far um give a, give a little breakdown of the basics of what you've seen from this role yeah, so this seems to be sort of when you're actually in flight, actively running around the ship and um, fixing stuff, which fixing stuff seems to have mostly been beaming it uh, based on the presentations that I've seen. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that's, that's almost placeholder gameplay and there's, um, there's more to it than that. I'd really like to see, see some variety around that role, sort of knowing this is this this part is broken therefore we need this part to fix it um it seemed like what they've been showing us over the years was the idea that components were going to have subcomponents inside them mm -hmm. and then those subcomponents would have to be um replaced but it does also seem kind of like they've scrapped that idea and just gone with this the fuses yeah yeah so there is the idea of replacing fuses, and that seems more related to power than just components. Um, expand a little bit more on what, what you mean, though. Like, you want to see just different different tools in the game, or what? Yeah, or, or even different mini-games. So, so one of the reasons I think mining works and is fun and engaging, sort of at least for me, is that that, that mini-game of sort of, you know, balancing the green your your lasers charge power into that green zone and holding it there and all of the various sort of gadgets and consumables and all that sort of stuff that you can do to to impact how your laser functions makes it an engaging makes it an engaging gameplay loop um, and sometimes you know particularly with the changes they've made recently where different rocks have different resistances and um, instabilities you know, if you get into multi-crew mining, then it then it does become sort of a case of like, uh, yeah, you, know, you you might actually have sort of four or five people sat round, not even just lasering the rock, but talking about the best way to laser this rock. You know, what what gadgets should we use for this one? What consumables should we use in this? Yeah, in this order. Um, I'm not saying just you know 
do the same mini game for engineering. I'm trying to mine my components. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm just saying that com compared to, and I, I know it's placeholder gameplay, but, you know, it's fun to make credits, but the reclaimer's structural salvage right now is is dull. It's boring. You, you, yeah. you click your left mouse button and you wait. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're the claw operator, I don't, I don't fully accept that. It's just placeholder gameplay. Um, but going around and using a healing laser beam on on components does kind of feel like that it feels feels like it would be fun in terms of the coordination between sort of the um yeah i've got forgotten the name for it the um the sort of person who's in charge the manager the manager yeah and and the the mechanics themselves sort of you know that there's that fun of fun element of you know it's this part and maybe providing them with a guide on where on the ship they need to go but if then when they get there, it is literally just like, I've got my multi-tool, point, click, hold. It, it could it could just get a little little bit boring. Yeah, um, no, so I, maybe, I agree with you there. So I suppose maybe just some, some having different, maybe a few different types of tool that you need to apply to different problems, sort of different natures of failures. So you'll, you'll sort of identify what type of mechanical failure it is based on based on a HUD readout, then match that to the appropriate tool, use the right tool, maybe play a play some form of skill based minigame. I think think that's really where I come from, that skill based minigames are often what makes this makes loops fun, fun yeah. or not. Yeah. And I think that design brief they shared on that a year ago, it did seem like he was saying there are different types of glitches you'll see. So I, I do hope that that's something they do where they're like, okay, these are the glitches you're seeing. This is the stuff you have to do. But it's also, I feel like I kind of want to see how it plays because between the fire extinguishers, you have to put out the fire, replacing mm -hmm. the fuses, replacing components, and then using the beam to repair components. Again, I'm not saying the beam is good enough, but between those four things, and then you spread that out across the ship where it might take 30 to 20 to 30 seconds to run across, it could get hectic. But that's just yeah. that's just during combat. So for everything else where there's no combat, but there are still kind of like glitches and repairs that might need to be done occasionally, it definitely feels like there needs to be a little bit more than just a, a beam pointing to to really sell that. I think I think just adding adding a little bit of a little bit of skill to it that, that doesn't maybe necessarily change, you know, you if you've got your beam and your beam is doing the if you get your beam onto that target, it is going to repair it over a certain amount of time. That's that's fine. But then, if there's maybe a a skill level, a, a skill based mini game that goes within that, which you can use to speed it up, I think. But but I think think you're right. If you overcomplicate it too much, then you add getting shot at and having about five or six possible things that you need to be doing then that could get too much if that gameplay is then yeah you know, and it could get overwhelming to people who are just trying to get into it yeah and then and then people just increasingly are like no i don't, I don't want to be the engineer yeah and it's it's interesting because that's like that is what some people want some people mm -hmm. want less some people more and it's like well how far do they do they want to go? Because however far they want to go, it's definitely going to like have some people in either in the category of loving this or sort of push them away. Um, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, though. I do think that they should do something more than than just the beam. Um, I think that so that's almost everything that we talked about. But how about the fire that's kind of included with the mechanic, I think, is, is putting out fires when I start to see them putting out fires, it does really start to draw that comparison that I think a lot of people make of uh, Sea of Thieves between, mm -hmm. between how you know, that works. You have to patch up holes and ditch out water. This is kind of like you got to repair components and put out fires. How do you, do you, are you excited for that kind of fire component? Do you think it might get out of hand? Um, how do you think it balances into engineering? Yeah, I think it's, um, I th I think it's a really good addition to have because it's uh, particularly as something which you have multiple ways of solving. So you could solve it with a fire extinguisher, but you could also solve it by venting your ship. So having like 
optionality over over how you deal with these things um, is really good, and I think the added the added level of danger on it sort of brings brings with it sort of the um, you because know, on certain ships you're going to be absolutely fully crewed and have an engineering team, and then other people are going to run this this option of just having you know if we need to do engineering then we'll jump out of what we're doing at the time and and pitch into that instead so it it brings in sort of you know you might not move because you've lost um one cooler on your ship you might not pull turret gunners off their off their posts for that but if you've got a fire that started that might be a like right we need to which of our turrets can we sacrifice because we need to sacrifice one of them because yeah. we need to put that fire out before it gets out of hand um, and we can't risk venting that part of the ship. So, so it's um, the the thing is though, particularly if it's a if it's a very dangerous sort of thing, if if fire is like you know, let's let's just say sort of in the realm of um, how dangerous these mechanical failures are, sort of fire maybe ranks at the top of your your worst case scenario list. It certainly looked that way in that footage of that reclaimer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that like was, that uh, shouldn't be something that in. just pops up. <laughs> then yeah that's that's the thing sort of it it shouldn't be in every fight you're gonna have a fire to deal with <laughs> that's that be. that's also really important for this whole segment of gameplay when we talk about this we're talking about it as a concentrated idea like when you talk about fighting in star citizen it doesn't mean you're fighting every day it doesn't mean you're running <laughs> into people who are shooting you all the time it's just a focus on on that gameplay engineering gameplay is not gonna be they know they're making a game and they know that engineering still needs to be a, a, a feature that makes people be more careful, but also um, is still like interesting and, and fun. And I mm -hmm. definitely think this could go too far and not be fun. And I don't think they're going to do that. From what you've seen so far, do, does it feel anywhere near too tedious? I think, I think the, I think the overall principle of it is, is really cool. Um, I'm I'm not too personally worried about the tedium of it, but I think that maybe comes from a, you know, speaking speaking almost selfishly, coming from a perspective of being in a decent sized org. So, I know that there are enough people in my org who are just so excited for this. You know, they're already they're already bugging me. Sorry, bugging me is a terrible term. <laughs> nicely nicely requesting um that we have an engineer role but in the in the discord you know we we have our roles sort of segregated into the type of gameplay that that people most enjoy yeah and some, and some people are asking for engineer already i'm like well you know hold your order a little <laughs> bit like it's not not actually in the game um but i know that there's there's people who are chomping at the bit to get into engineering so i know that if i find it wildly tedious then um then yeah, it'll be, it'll be something which I'll have plenty of people who want to uh, want to tune up whatever ship that we're going out in next. Um, I can I can understand that if you are solo or if you're sort of in a in a small group, and all of you are really into like you know let's just say fighting, you just all want to get out there and pew pew. And right now you can you can fire up your ships and you can start pew pewing. Um, then it might not have you over the moon to to think about you know which one of you has to go in goal basically yeah yeah all right let's talk about that third and final role in engineering again it's not a these aren't delineated lines there's no skills or anything this is just kind of how they've explained the the profession but uh we talked about the tuner we've talked about the mechanic now we're on to the manager and you mentioned this a little bit earlier what is the manager doing yeah, so it's a, they have that um, view of it from the console of the C2. So you, you'll have, and a lot of ships have an, an engineering station uh, that I struggled to get out just there. Um, but the interface to that looked really cool, um, particularly sort of building in with the current the current new map that they're working on to to show all of the different um, different areas of the ship, uh, to show what's what's being problematic, where you've got issues, and also controlling some of the the more macro systems things like these um the resources like the oxygen control the oxygen flow to the room 
So you could maybe look at locking off a certain room, removing the oxygen, putting out the fire that way. Um, uh, but also, I think it would be really a role for a good communicator. It's where sort of communication is so important in in any sort of multi-crew. Yeah, you, know, you have to be the person who is. You've got the bird's eye view of what's going wrong on the ship. So uh, being able to direct your mechanics is hugely important. Yeah, I I think it's going to be really cool when you're you've got your pilot who's flying the ship, your engineer who's who's monitoring the ship, and then their captain who's actually ordering what happens with the ship, and you hear the communication back and forth between what they're doing and what's going on, because that engineer's definitely going to have to call out to the other people in the crew, hey, we just lost this turret, uh, maybe we should fly not in that direction. Yeah, yeah. So, you like the UI? Um, do you, what do you, gosh, I'm trying to remember... It's probably going to change a little bit from Citizen Con, huh? Because I think what they showed us looked a little bit unfinished. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope it hope it continues to get improved upon. But generally, sort of having just looked at the Evo patch a little bit, the the new map looks looks really good to me. So I, I hope cool. it's just sort of built up off that. Did you guys? They were trying to get a a, a test out for engineering and arena commander for three twenty three. That's kind of what what brought on the idea to do the episode mm -hmm. this week did that end up happening uh i i honestly uh, i my first time jumping into the evo patch was actually last night so oh. i'd heard about this engineering uh engineering patch uh, engineering test but didn't manage to get in and take a look at it i'm looking for man it's crazy to think we're like days away possibly from this mechanic that we've been hearing about since i think october of 2020 like that's mm -hmm. when they really started to talk about it it was four years ago almost um and we're finally getting to play it but i think putting it into into arena commander is is a fantastic idea so because if, if you can sort of throw it at people and see how it is in sort of really high stress type situations yeah and that's um and and allow testing where it doesn't really matter if it goes wrong then that's uh, that's gonna be a fantastic way for us to test it out and learn yeah hopefully that doesn't lead to the feedback skewing it more towards exciting moments i imagine cig themselves are very aware that that could happen um but you know it, it'd be good to know that the testing is also focusing on what happens in normal play and i guess we won't really see that till it's in the pu yeah but i think as well sort of it is one of those things where um so i used to play used to play a game called atlas when it came out which was unfortunately it died a death uh, but it was quite fun at the time um and one of the things which we don't have in SC at the moment, but we will have, is really long journey times. So sometimes in Atlas, you know, you would you would take a journey on which you were aware was going to take you sort of three hours of sailing, that sort of thing. Oh, yes, I heard about this. Um, yeah, they were talking about this the other day. And it was quite fun having things to do on the ship during those three hours, rather than just, you know, taking it in turns to steer and watching Netflix. <laughs> um so you know you would have things that you could do like um to improve your sails to repair your ship so so you'd be sort of flying through uh, sailing through battles and you didn't fly in that game um you might sort of run into a couple of enemy ships you might take a bit of damage but but win that fight and then sail on but then while while your captain was sailing on then the rest of you would take that moment to get around and fix the ship um, and I think sort of having this tuning and and some standard repair work to sort of do, it might not seem brilliant right now. But if you're if you're talking about you know your crew has to make a multi system jump that's going to take you a good few hours, then actually that that sort of regularized maintenance work might be quite fun. Yeah. To just do during the journey. And it's also how many things are they going to be adding to these ships? Arcade machines. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. we've got chess, and I'm not I'm not trying to say that people should get ready to like use <laughs> board games to find Star Citizen entertaining, but item management. Um, I hate to use this as an example, but they talk about soft skills, so maybe things like I, I, I'm not even going to get into that. Never mind. But like item <laughs> management. Um, maybe data bank management, figuring out, uh, hopefully AC is something that we can access through sim pods and stuff. There's just a lot of probably ways that they can continue to make that process fun as in addition to engineering. 
gosh, yeah. the sun, I can't get away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so going back to the manager role, though, how, how involved does it see if the mechanic is the one running around repairing everything? Do you think the manager is actually going to have a lot to do? I think, I think it's good from a perspective of... Um... You know, particularly if they can work this in, knowing that those those two people should be working together, that it's a team working job. So, you know, maybe maybe to a certain part, if the mechanic is going to repair it, the the manager has to turn off the power to it, or the or the mechanic will get electrocuted. You know, or or the mechanic um, can't see visually necessarily which of two similar looking parts are actually damaged as easily as if the manager sort of directs them specifically you know it's the shield generator on the left mm -hmm. um so so yeah but the the other thing though is that particularly maybe on smaller ships uh, where you have less distance to travel the, these roles might be the same person it might be a case of you know a single engineer does the manager and the mechanic role they just go to the Go to the management desk. All right, okay. We've got an issue with cooler two, which is you know take a mental note the one in the back right. <laughs> so um, so right, I know where I'm going now. Off I go, sort of mechanic hat on. I like that idea of cutting the power to that area. And going back to kind of your idea that the beams should be uh, joined by other little mini games. Maybe the you have to. <laughs> Do something with the power coupling to the component when you get there as the mechanic and if you try to do that thing before the person turns the power off you get shocked that's yeah, yeah. that's a good one that calls for that teamwork makes it so that you have to pay attention to multiple things if you are playing the same roles and playing the same roles on smaller ships is kind of where we want to take this discussion because really the the big question i think a lot of people are having is how is this going to affect them as a solo player um you you're not <laughs> I guess you could be the manager, mechanic, and tuner in your solo ship. But do you think people are actually going to need to do that a lot? you think this is something that's going to make the solo gameplay just a complete drag for people now? I, I, think, I think it's quite interesting that, to look at some of the ships that CIG are releasing or have announced in the run-up to this. So things specifically, I'm thinking like the Spirits, um, and also the, uh, was it the Zeus series? Yeah, the Zeus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's cool and interesting that they've released a bunch of ships which are really good looking two to three cruise ships. Um, because I think one of the biggest differences probably is that I, I think there's still plenty of room for solo players. Um, I, think, I think it would be a terrible idea to shut solo players out of this game. Because most MMOs, which if, if MMOs don't cater to the audience who like playing solo, then they tend to die. You know, those people who like playing solo, they are a huge, huge part of a potential audience for a game. Yeah. So, and, and games, games which are way too hardcore and don't allow solo players, they, they do tend to not last that long. Um, so I, I think CIG is smart enough to know that. But I think what solo players might find is that you know maybe a c2 isn't your ship anymore maybe maybe if you are dedicated to being a solo player maybe you should give up hope on that polaris <laughs> or you know it's like that's that's a multi-crew ship that's going to take an org to run whereas what I what I would love to see out of CRG is just more of the same, more of these sort of smaller ships, like two, three player ships, maybe even some some dedicated solo ships that are that are still premium, that are still better than starter ships. So it's not. Um, I, th I think one of the one of the best things they could do is get away from this this sort of ranking of ships where it goes like starter solo then you advance and advancement means increasing your crew size I, it'd be great to see some sort of um, sideways motion where it's like your ship gets better because it's a better ship it's got better parts but it doesn't get better in terms of being just bigger and having more crew um, you know it 
it does feel kind of what you're saying. Oh my gosh. Kind of what you're saying. Uh, it does feel like that, that has been going on a little bit. Like the Siulin, I think is a really good solo, solid mm -hmm. sideways kind of ship. Um, things get a little more specialized when you get to the Hull A, but even something like the 100i is like, I think that's a really good ship to keep just because it has the refinery. Um, it's got a bed, it's got cargo. You can actually take these smaller ships a really long way. And I fully agree with you. Um, making sure those ships are still valuable is going to be pretty key to making sure that this, this doesn't kill solo gameplay. Not that it will, yeah. but... That it, uh, I don't I don't know that it doesn't you want this to be something solo players need to deal with but you also want people to be able to use ships that they know aren't going to have to deal with this stuff and I think those smaller ships are definitely where that comes in you know you're, you're running something that's the equivalent to a car today that's yeah. not going to be experiencing a lot of trouble all the time because you're just flying it from A to B and I think I think the other the other sort of side of it as well is like preparation you know, you you might be if you, if you're intending to play solo, you might have to be a bit more responsible for your preparation. You know, if I'm if you if you're driving your car and you know you're about to go and drive your car on a five hour journey, yeah, you, know, you you might want to check the oil first. So I think sort of for for solo players, it'll be a case of you know either do that tuning or pay for the tuning to be done by NPCs before yeah. you set out on your on your trip or yeah. if you come back pay your bills for repairing a ship whereas if somebody else in like a big org is flying around in a ship with a bunch of engineers on board yeah maybe they can they can afford to skip that step and they're just like ah oh, i don't know it's power plant a bit wonky we'll fix that on the way let's get going lads yeah it's kind of what we already do you you go and you get your ship repaired if mm -hmm. you could you could just say if you get your ship repaired every time you land at a space station you're never going to experience a glitch but you know how we are we forget about that stuff and that's kind of where those things start to come up and where you probably want to make sure you know a little bit of the gameplay so yeah. yeah i i do think that at least in terms of how intrusive this would be i wouldn't expect it to be worse than what we have right now where you experience torque imbalance quite a bit. Um, you, you might take damage and your thrusters might not work as well. You do have to get your ship repaired and basically anytime you go into battle. Obviously that stuff complicates, but it doesn't seem from what we've seen like they want engineering to be something that affects those smaller ships as much. I know, I'd, I'd, I'd also say so maybe it's going to be better than what we have now even for players who aren't that interested in the loop because it will mean that you can fix your problems you know right yeah, right now point. right now for example like if you get a major torque imbalance that's that's it your ship's flying wonky until till you get it back to a space station and sometimes crash. sometimes that trip back to a space station is really painful when if you put too much thrust in then you're going to spin in a circle yeah um now, right now, of course, like everybody just, well, not everybody, I've known some people to uh, to grin and bear it just for the, the RP. But a lot of people will just at that point just be like, well, blow up the ship. Yep. Back to space. Back to the station with me or escape exit to menu. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're intending to go on a solo expedition, sort of exploring somewhere, and if we have future systems like Death of a Spaceman, where it's going to be an impact if you, if you backspace, and when you escape and exit to menu, you're going to log back in. You're going to be in exactly the same spot in the same broken ship. You know, having the tools to be able to go, well, my ship's broken, but I prepared because I knew I was solo and I, um, I can repair my ship or I can put a call out to somebody who specializes in repairing ships. Space AA, please. <laughs> so. Stanton's triple A. That is, that is, um, it's... It is uh, going to be something that helps people a lot. I think you're right about that. Because the amount of times when you, you just have, like, if, even if your ship is damaged cosmetically, it'd be nice to be able to fix it for, like, a picture or something instead of flying all the way back to a space station to, to repair it. And this is kind of ship repair. Like, we've been talking about how components will take damage and 
um, ships won't actually explode. They'll kind of just be killed via component and by armor. And that shift to damage means this shift to engineering is kind of the real ship repair we've been waiting for, too. You, you yeah. basically be able to find a derelict ship and theoretically get it back up and running if you have the parts. Yeah, and that's that's the thing as well. This is this is sort of the start of that repair loop. For, for you know, I, I know um, there are some some players in my org who are who are equally desperate for that sort of to go and go and refuel people who have run out of fuel. Kind of the fuel rats gameplay from uh, from Elite Dangerous. Yeah. So, so sort of offering that AAA service, which obviously in the current state of the game, you know, it's, it's a bit the same way that a lot of people don't use medical beacons, because it's like, wow, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just take the death, and I'll go back and get my stuff myself, or my stuff wasn't really valuable to me, and there's no real penalty to dying, so I'll just take the, I'll take my time back and just, just get on with my day. Um, but I think in the future, sort of, as these systems come in and as it's more important to try and keep yourself alive, um, there, there's a lot more gameplay for people who want to do, you know, medical repair, refuel. I think, sort of, for for the repair and refuel side, sort of engineering, it's really the the start of that that yeah. really coming online. Yeah. Are you? Let's see. What else do I have to ask you about this? Um, I guess let's wrap up that idea about, about solo players and how they'll view this. Do you think it's going to end up being annoying? Undoubtedly, somebody, somebody's going to find it annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 that's fair. Yeah. There's, but I think for the, I think for the most part, um, I, I don't think so because the problem is if you, you know, CRG or try and make a game that's challenging but at the end of the day fun and also we we have we have pretty great ways to give feedback to crg so so you know if it's really not fun then <laughs> then then you they know, will feed, know feed that back yeah they're gonna um, know on every platform there is the one the one thing i would say is uh, if you find it really fun feed that back too because there there is always a bit of a danger i think that um you know the, the the voices that say this suck um end up being louder than than the voices which say this is really good because because when people think something's really good they just they're too busy uh cracking on and enjoying it to write a spectrum post uh so it's so yeah it's definitely worth sort of whatever your feedback is um giving that feedback but i think i think it probably even even for solo players you know what What's what's the reason a lot of people are playing solo? Yeah, because I've I've played MMOs solo and survival games solo, and a big part of it is the challenge of of surviving on your own in a big scary world. Yeah, where lots of stuff's trying to kill you, <laughs> or get in your way. <laughs> like sounds so, like somebody's living in pyro. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but, the, but the but the thing is that you know I think this. This brings that extra little bit of challenge, and it's that thing that solo players have to have to think their way around. You know, right? I uh, I better take some spare parts. I better make sure my ships ships all like nice and looked after. I'm going to invest in the better quality component. Yeah, with the higher durability, that's less likely to start a fire. These okay. these features, the engineering components, can becoming more important um uh the cargo system that we're getting and i think whenever they start focusing on bed logging it feels like these are kind of the pillars of that really long distance gameplay where you're not going you're not even going to the deep pocket of a of a star system i know everything that we've seen on the star map on the website that's lore it could always be you know changed for whatever reason but have you have you seen the size of star systems in this game yeah yeah yeah. Oh my gosh! It's so like Stan Stanton's a baby system. Stanton is so <laughs> small, yeah. and and we we really do. You know, I think a lot of people assume that most of the star systems will be the same size as Stanton, but some of them in lore are like twenty five to thirty times the size of Stanton. <laughs> and and even even then, 
there are space stations that just don't have civilization. So that idea of going out, having those components on hand, having all the food, all the fuel, all the ammo that you might need, you and friends might need for days, um, really starts to become more believable when you look at this sort of gameplay. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's sort of the, you know, it brings in that sort of aspect of space exploration. There's, there's a really great, um, and it can, it can impact all sorts of, all sorts of gameplay loops as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's an there's an episode of uh, Firefly, I think, where they're they're smuggling some contraband, and then they break down in the middle of nowhere, having purposely taken the route that puts them off the main trade lanes because they're smuggling contraband. And then, for the sake of one little part, their ship's broken. Yeah, so so it's like it'll make people make those choices, yeah. which where which you don't have to worry about in the game right now. And that's also good for missions. Just doing a cargo hauling mission Mm -hmm. is fun. And some people might hate this, but the idea of doing a cargo hauling mission and having that possibility of maybe your ship breaks down, maybe you get attacked by a pirate, maybe you, you, you come across a distress beacon and decide to help and that turns into a fetch quest. But like that idea that these things can pop up in the middle of a normal mission to complicate your day. Like I said, some people might hate that because they just want to do the, do what they signed up for, but it really can um spice up the gameplay a lot yeah and i think i think as well sort of for solo players in particular just just keeping keeping with them sort of i I often ask myself like why are you playing but i I don't ask myself i I get asked sometimes in comments so why would solo players play a mmo go play squadron 42 that's what you're waiting for solo player and and i'm like no (laughs) Like, like so People people might play these games solo, but they, I think, sort of the majority of them probably still want human interactions. Yeah, you know, they still want to be in a world with other human beings. They just don't necessarily want to be in an org with them, on a multi cruise ship with them. That's that's absolutely fine. That's cool. Yeah, but like this is a reason to have, not not org level interactions with people, but just you know. You broke down. Some Somebody beacons. came and rescued you. Yeah. You know, you got some gameplay with another person. They helped you out. Maybe they robbed you. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> you, you know, but it was exciting because you didn't know at the point where they pulled up whether they were going to rob you. You know, it's it's and it's these interactions that we realistically should be playing MMORPGs for. They, you know they will have really succeeded if players are getting into this game and asking for refuel or restocking or repair out in space and are second guessing whether or not it's a player or an npc that came out, showed up to help them yeah, yeah, like yeah. that that would be the pinnacle i think of like an immersive experience with the ai working and mm-hmm. players also working on the same systems and doing the same things no matter where you are but that's that's crazy we'll <laughs> see if that ever happens Let's go back to big ships real quick. Um, We've talked a lot about how this will kind of lessen the amount of solo playability with these ships. It makes these ships a little bit more vulnerable in the sense that you have to pay more attention to their systems and stuff. Um, But is it is this is this also a good thing? Like, is this a good or a bad thing for big ships? Are there benefits to the fact that they're now getting engineering built in? Yeah, I, I, I think. I think it's definitely a good thing um, because it also creates sort of multiple roles within while you're all working to the same purpose. So like I know people who don't have any interest in combat whatsoever, which will probably come as a wild shock to the PVP community that you know, somebody could, could not like shooting guns. Um, but there are people who, who have no interest in that and so this provides a non-combat role for somebody to get involved in combat. You know, the, the orc is taking out a big ship. So they don't go as a turret gunner or as a pilot. They might go as an engineer. So it's, it's bringing in more types of gameplay for people who are interested in different aspects, Yeah, which I think is really good. And I think it's probably on these big ships that the engineering gameplay is going to feel probably the most intense if you don't have... You know, if you've got two capital ships wailing on each other, the difference between who wins and who loses might well be who brought the better engineering team. You know, putting out the fires, like if, 
if we're talking about sort of time to kill being a completely different different kettle of fish then um then yeah you know one team one team has a really good engineering team the other team's ship is completely ablaze with multiple fires in multiple uh <laughs> multiple areas and gradually they run out of oxygen so that's you know, a, that's a crappy way to die you don't even die be, from the be, fire you yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. we Oi. didn't even waste a size 10 rail gun on you yeah Oof. so um yeah so i think that's that's gonna be gonna be that pretty is, huge that is a good benefit but as far as the actual function of the ship like do you think this we, we started this conversation out talking about how currently if you took out a hammerhead it'd be like taking out a vanguard right but let's say you take out a hammerhead and an equivalent being like five arrows i don't know but what is what's going to convince people given this engineering system now besides the idea of getting more gameplay for people what's going to convince people to use that hammerhead instead of the five fighters i th i think it's sort of um that's really got to be addressed in terms of the where the relative power lies and i think relative power right now because right right now things are just it, it comes down to a couple of numbers you know what's what's your total dps output what's your range what's your hp pool you know shields plus hull but in the future that hammerhead just might not get scratched by the size two guns on the fighters um similarly sort of the they're talking about sort of with the changes to gimbals and auto gimbals turrets being just more effective than they are now um and with that you might also have the added complexity of the engineering gameplay and therefore require more crew um but also you've probably got more chance for things to go wrong so there's more survivability in the big ship yeah, you had to bring That's an true. engineering team, but they were able to fix the problems which went wrong. Whereas yeah. when your um, when your arrow got your know, power plant destroyed, <laughs> you're, you're, you're just adrift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that there's a lot more redundancy. Yeah, with the bigger yeah. ship is, and we've seen that too in the designs. If you you could lose certain fuses and still be able to power your ship, so that is a good point. Like you're extending your lifetime quite a bit. You're increasing the amount of eyes that can cover things like damage and maybe your weapons stop working, maybe you have to reload your ballistics or something. Mm -hmm. there, yeah, there's, there's, there's some intuitive benefits to being on a larger ship. I like that, at least in terms of combat. And we, and we mentioned as well, sort of, um, in terms of the star systems, so it's one that lulls you into a false sense of security things about SC, is that we, we currently tootle around in Stanton and... You know, I, I flew from one side of Stanton to the other today, and then I had to refuel my Cutlass, which I did at one of the many space stations. And then I could fly straight back all the way across the system if I wanted to with <laughs> yeah. an XL1 fastest drive. I could I could fit in that slot. So, so you know, it's it's there's no real inconvenience to it. Whereas, you know, one of the things which will stop you bringing your five fighters in the future is. Your, your five fighters will still be traveling to the fight when it's long and over. Yeah. You're also, yeah, you have lower stats, you have less fuel, you have less storage. Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a few reasons. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that, that comes into things with, like, industry, exploration. Yeah, range, range will probably be one of the really big restricting factors mm -hmm. on smaller ships. There's also the the aspect of power um, we haven't really touched on is you have to balance the power to each turret, light, life support, um, everything in your ship uses power and you either have to use your power plant or a battery with, you know, that's been charged to keep those things powered and the, the manager has to decide what's getting what power. That's, that's a pretty big one because like, yeah, you could have 50 different slots where you could put power supply but you might only have 25 available power slots, you know? So you have to pick, is that mm -hmm. gonna be mostly shields, mostly power, mostly thrusters, mostly, it's like the power balance we do right now with the triangle, but in a much more, a much more varied sense that yeah, you like want an engineer for that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think this is sort of, if they, if they get this right, this is where, where it ends up sitting right, you know, that it's, it's not necessarily a, an absolute must have, or it's something which you can just shimmy people who are doing other roles into engineering 
in a in a pinch in an emergency mm -hmm. Absolutely. and you could you could approach it like that or you could approach it as we have an absolutely dedicated engineering crew on board our ship who this is their main gameplay loop and they love it and they know everything about it yeah but but the sacrifice we pay for that is that you know we we obviously have to take more crew on board our ship and more of our crew might be sat around playing you know chess or yep. whatever other games they give us and you got to pay them for that time for a longer time and yeah they still have to get a paycheck from whatever we've mined or won or whatever so yeah 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 it's um it's it's definitely going to mix things up this is it's it's just a lot of implications to it Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. And, the, and the, the coolest part is that it's not mandatory. You don't have to do this. You don't have to take part in it. You could always just get your stuff repaired at, at, at stations, keep those power supplies at the default, and you basically just run the game by default. You can do it in, in um, Star Wars Squadrons. You can do it in No Man's Sky. You can do it in Starfield. Every space game allows you to either dip more into this kind of gameplay or just keep it as default. And this is just a bigger scale version of that, but I really like where it's going. Yeah, certainly. I would agree. I have one more question to, for you before we get going. And this one is about the overall gameplay that we're seeing come into the game. So I'm thinking uh, the heat system that'll keep us using VTOLs and atmospheric, or the heat system and control surfaces that keep us using VTOLs and keep us moving and make sure we're not like just kind of sitting around doing nothing. The weather systems that are supposed to blow us down, the maelstrom system, damage, engineering, um, all of these things they're kind of bringing to the game that take the main thing everyone's been doing for years, which is just flying ships around like they're all just different sized boxes of the same ship and starting to specialize it all more. Do you think that piloting ships is going to become more of a rarity for people? Like we're going to see more and more people who just either aren't comfortable enough piloting ships to do it or just straight up don't want to? So I, yes would be my my one word answer. Um, but it's a podcast, so we'll, we'll, we'll try for a bit more of that. We're good. Uh, we yes, got it. And we're done. Um, I, I, think, I think to a degree that already does happen. There are some people who, like I know from my, my own org, who will take any opportunity not to fly. Um, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm one of them. Sometimes I do just like getting flown around. It's it's quite relaxing to to get into the get into the co-pilot seat of a Connie and just sit out a journey. Uh, but that's more due to laziness. Um, whereas some some people, you know, they're they're much more confident or comfortable being a turret gunner, or they you know they love things like the FPS element of Star Citizen, and really aren't bothered by the spaceships at all. Spaceships are just a car that gets them from a to B and point B is another point to go and go and shoot bad guys with their uh, their assault rifle. Um, so so yeah, there's there's plenty of people, and I think as the game expands and there's more roles in it, then then I think yeah, it will will probably decrease. Pro probably you know probably everybody will still have a car, a uh, you know, a spaceship that gets them around, but like there are people nowadays who who really love driving and do it as a hobby as well as um, using it to get to work. And then there are other people who just drive to get to the places they need to be. And then there are people who don't drive at all and just take the bus or the train. You know? so, yeah. so I think that will that'll happen in SE and, and more and more as we get more roles in. When we get things like base building in, I'm pretty sure there are people who will just just be like, well, I I live on my space farm out on the you know, the third moon of this system. Yeah, they kind um, of they kind of have been starting to talk more about localized gameplay and, and emphasizing the idea that people are meant to stick around planets or planetary systems for longer than we expect right now. Like, you're not supposed to be flying from Stanton to Microtech or from Hurston to Microtech four times a day. It's, mm -hmm. it's too much flying. They need more gameplay around, and that would really, uh, really help, I think, not just give people who don't want to fly more gameplay but just keep people sticking around do you think it's bad that the game starts to push people out of flying like they make it too difficult no i think it's i i think as long as it's a so that that's one thing which i would say about all of these things like i think the 
the floor to getting into any particular role does always need to be low enough. Like, and I think think that's that's where they just need to remember they're making a game, um, and that it's it's meant to be fun and it's meant to be accessible. Um, so so I, I like things which are they have they have a low skill floor so you can get into them and you can get competent fairly quickly, but that still have a still have a skill ceiling which is is relatively high. So to to get really good at something, you do have to practice it and become skilled in it. Um, that is always, of course, going to be a a challenge for game designers everywhere. That's that's sort of the holy grail, isn't it? To design something that's accessible but also has a high skill ceiling. Um, yeah, and so to, to try and do that with twelve different game systems and something like this. Yeah, so I'd, so I'd hate it if it was if it was kind of like you know players basically said I don't fly anywhere in Star Citizen because it's too hard because I don't know you know, because I have to have a manual and uh, I have to have attended twenty hours of mandatory training and done a test to get my pilot's license to. To we take off, hour. like you know, it's 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 sort of like you still need it to be something that somebody can get into. But if the reason people aren't flying is because there are just areas of the game that they find more fun, and and that's because there's plenty of different rules to do, sort of on mm-hmm. a ship or off a ship, then that's great. Like yeah, all right, I'll take that. I can't wait to see how it turns out. We're going to see engineering for the first time in Alpha 323 uh, probably next week, I would say. It seems is, the, is, is when we're looking at if everything goes smoothly. And hopefully it's live in game later this year. It's going to be a big change. It's going to start to introduce a lot more complex gameplay with capital ships coming in. And it's definitely something that we'll be talking about again in the future. Probably on this, probably on Citizen Central, and probably on the stream. So thank you all for coming. And Loud Guns, you specifically, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I was excited for this talk this is a really this is one of my top three parts of the game and i'm so pumped to see it's finally coming in um any last thoughts on the system from yourself like you know gripes or things that you might want to see or things you want to see other people asking about in the comments about about the system i think i I think it'd just be interesting to see see who's actually excited to be an engineer because i think it might surprise it might surprise the people who think that this is a terrible idea and aren't aren't looking forward to it at all so um, but there are people out there who have who've already got their engineer hat at the ready <laughs> they've got their discord rules yeah and before you go can you let folks know where they can find your own content uh yep yeah, uh, loud guns here on youtube and on twitch although i haven't really been doing too much of the latter recently one bedroom flats uh, not not the best thing to uh, twitch stream in so be like that yeah go check out the channel very good stuff great tutorials guides and information on the gameplay development um hope you all enjoyed this episode this is the video on youtube of course but if you are so inclined to skip out on ads audio free audio platform is ad free supported by our supporters who are also here live with us hey y'all thanks for joining us um i hope you enjoyed this episode thanks again for coming and watching us rabble on about uh, a game system that's not in game yet <laughs> but hopefully soon I'll catch y'all next week. Bye.